Hello, and welcome to SEED's instant update on the monkeypox outbreak globally. As you know, we are still combating the COVID-19 pandemic. And as we've often said, just because you're in the middle of one threat doesn't make it less likely. In fact, it may make it more likely since our resilience is compromised, since our resources are otherwise engaged to potentially have other threats show up on, on the stage. And that's what we're seeing with monkeypox. With me today, I have Dr. Davidson Hamer, who's an infectious diseases physician, and he's a professor of global health at the BU School of Public Health. He's also a co-lead for surveillance for GeoSentinel, um, as well as Dr. John Connor, who is a virologist, um, as well as faculty in microbiology here at Boston University. Both of them are faculty at the National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratories at BU, as well as our center, the BU Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases Policy and Research. I wanted to ask them the question that's on all of, all of your minds um, and to give you a bit more of a background on the situation, on the pathogen, and what tools we have available. So let me, um, let me start with you, John. Tell us a little bit about monkeypox, the virus, and the disease. Yeah, so monkeypox is an orthopox virus. It's a member of a family of viruses that includes cowpox, it includes vaccinia, which is the virus that was used to eradicate another member of the family, smallpox, from circulating on this planet. Uh, and monkeypox is a disease that has circulated uh, in Africa for a very large number of years. It's been recognized for decades. And this is one of the major outbreaks that we've seen beyond the, the borders of Africa. And um, given that this is something that we're seeing for the first time, David, can you tell us a little bit about the situation currently with monkeypox? Where, where does this outbreak look like uh, in the non-endemic diseases, as, as John said, or non-endemic countries, as John said? Sure, I'm happy to do that. So this has been moving fairly quickly. I mean, there are estimates that there are uh, 50 to 60 confirmed, laboratory confirmed cases per day um, in, in the last few weeks. And at this point, there are more than 900 cases, perhaps pushing 1,000. Um, uh, many of these are laboratory confirmed. Uh, most of them are relatively mild, which is good. I mean, if, if a small proportion have been hospitalized, but that's mainly for isolation purposes. Uh, the, the, there are many countries that have reported cases. Um, the, many of the cases where data are available are men. Uh, they're they're uh, men between ages of 20 and 59. And uh, many have presented to basically sexually transmitted infection clinics, to sexual health services. Um, and, and a lot of this appears to be being driven by uh, men who have sex with men, but also uh, bisexual men um, with relatively few cases in, in, in women. Um, and the epidemiology is interesting. It turns out there are, there are now three different large gatherings of men who have sex with men, MSMs, um, one in Antwerp associated with a fetish festival, uh, one in Madrid and then another on the Canary Islands that appear to have served as uh, amplifying and, and super spreading events. Um, and you know, almost none of these uh, individuals have, have a history of travel to endemic areas in West Africa. Uh, the, the analysis of the strain suggests that, that they're, they're really, you know, maybe John can comment on this more, but they're really sort of two major sort of strains of the virus or clades of the virus. And, and thus far, everything points to this being the West African strain, which is found in Nigeria and some surrounding countries, which fortunately has a tendency to cause milder disease with a very low case fatality rate, as opposed to the Congo strain, um, which can be responsible for more severe disease. Yeah, David, I, I think you mentioned um, the events that, uh, that may have led to the spread of this disease among networks of, of MSM, of closely knit social networks, of which, you know, this is in particular MSM. Can you clarify for us why this is, people hear this and they will think they are not at risk, you know, if they're not part of this community. Can we stress about um, what we think the epidemiology applies and, and what it does not imply? So, so there, you know, there is a risk to to basically anyone who who um, you know has potential you know close contact with somebody who's infected. So, so all members of the population of our you know global population are at risk, 
it's basically, you know, having just close contact with somebody, uh, you know, especially close skin to skin contact is going to lead to an infection. So this is not, this is not a disease that's isolated to, to one high risk population, but instead is something that, that, you know, almost anyone can capture. Thank you for that, David. Um, John, can you tell us, um, and I think both of you, can you tell us what's concerning to you about the current situation and what are the risks that the current outbreak uh, will become a pandemic threat? John, I'll let you go first. I, I'm happy to go first. So the, uh, from my perspective, the thing that has been the most unique about this particular event is not that monkeypox has been exported and has arrived in a different country. This has happened multiple times. It has happened in Europe, it's happened in the UK, it's happened in the United States, it's happened in very many different places around the world. But in the past, it has been trans it has been exported in a way that it was recognized fairly early. And the individual was identified and there was very little onward transmission. The difference in this outbreak is that it was not a case of there was one individual who was quickly caught. It looks like there has been some transmission ongoing for a while. And that has allowed more transmission because it has essentially been below the radar, not caught by traditional travel medicine approaches or things like that. And that now that it is being recognized, there is a very robust response and I'm really encouraged by that. I don't think that this represents a situation where there will now be wildfire transmission, but I do think it's something where people have to be aware that now there's a new instance of how this disease has been transmitted around the world and to be aware that it is a possibility and something that really should be looked into. Yeah, David, what about your thoughts? So, I, I mean, I think that this is definitely not going to turn into a pandemic. I think it's we're going to be able to control it. Um, there are some challenges, um, contact tracing, which would be ideal, which, as John has said, you know, with some of the other single importations of monkeypox in the past, we've been able to identify, you know, family members and healthcare workers that have had exposures. But in this case, there, there are often people that have had multiple exposures and, and may not even know all their partners. And that's, that's made contact tracing challenging. Um, you know, there is a risk to healthcare workers, which I didn't note, but I think if healthcare workers use proper um, sort of equipment um, you know, with sort of gowns, gloves, masks, and so forth, and eye, 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 eye shields, just basically the same kind of measures we'd use for COVID-19, that will protect them and reduce their risk to, to pretty much non-existent. Um, you know, I think that the, I think this is gonna come under control, um, but it's gonna take some time. Um, and and we, yeah, I think it's more widespread. And I think there's some important questions too, that the, some of the patients are being misclassified as another sexually transmitted infection. And so it, it, we need to educate um, clinicians about how to diagnose this. And then one thing that we have no idea is whether there can be asymptomatic transmission. You know, we're quite attuned to that from what we've learned about SARS-CoV-2, but, but there's really no known evidence that this can be transmitted um, without um, symptoms, but, but that's because most of the, the studies of this disease have been in endemic areas where there's very limited resources to study them. Yeah, what a great point. So the challenges here are that we have lost chains of transmission, which means we're finding cases in the community who we don't know where people may have gotten that disease, and it doesn't seem to be travel like the last time. And as you mentioned, clinically, it seems to be presenting like other things and atypically from what we know about monkeypox, and it may be confused as other aspects. It sounds like maybe another uh, challenge might also be that the incubation period is so long. Yeah, no, the incubation period is is relatively long. I mean, you know, sort of various measures from as short as a few days to as long as almost three weeks. But, you know, on average, you know, sort of five to 15 days. So that's that's much longer than a, a disease like, say, COVID-19, where it's just a few days. And then you're, you're you can sort of recall who you've been with and who you've had close contact with. But if it goes out over two weeks or even three weeks, you know, the full range of the incubation period, that makes it harder to do contact tracing. 
you for that, David. John, you mentioned that the virus hasn't changed a lot, or at least we're hearing that the virus hasn't genetically changed a lot, but you mentioned that there were a couple of different clads or a couple of different, um, you know, instances of different strains of this virus that are circulating. Could you tell us what the implication of both the first and the second of those two things are and what that means in terms of our fight against monkeypox? Yeah, so, so from what's known about monkeypox, there are, are basically two general divisions that can be made based on their genetics. But there is a, there's a monkeypox that circulates in Western Africa, in Nigeria, and west of that, which David mentioned. Uh, there's also monkeypox that is genetically different that circulates in the Democratic Republic of Congo and areas around that. And they appear to have different severity. In the West Africa clade is what is currently known to be circulating around the world. And that is the less pathogenic strain. So that's very encouraging if you just think about it in terms of if we could have gotten one or other clade of monkeypox, we would have chosen this if we could. We'd rather not have either. But if we have one, the West Africa clade has been the less pathogenic strain so far. Can I add something? I, I think it's important, actually, I'm sort of thinking about transmission and what we know about this disease. And you know, besides a few sporadic cases that have occurred related to travel to uh, Central and West Africa, you know, we did have a monkeypox outbreak in the United States a few years ago. They were associated with prairie dogs. And that, that came from an infected animal or animals um, that came from West Africa. And there was cross infection, I think, at pet shops. And then people were you know, sort of buying prairie dogs to have as pets. And their kids and, and the family members were handling them and, and then developing pox, basically the monkeypox. And that, that eventually was controlled by identifying the animal reservoir um, isolating people and, and really did no, no great harm. You know, this, and so we, we've dealt with this before, um, but it also sort of raises the point that you know, anybody can become infected. Um, and uh, it, at least if it's the West African strain, it does appear to be pretty mild. And we should probably talk a little bit about, you know, we do have some, you know, there's two vaccines available for prevention, not necessarily post-exposure prophylaxis, although one of them could be used if given early. And then there are a couple of treatments that are really designed for smallpox, but probably will work well against monkeypox. Before you go there, though, I do want to drill in on this point about what CDC said last Friday, I believe, about the fact that there are a couple of different sequences uh, of the cases that are available in the U.S. There are a couple of different sequences. What is, what is the importance of that finding? What does that tell us? So the importance of that finding is it tells us a little something about how all the transmission got started. It argues that there were two separate introduction events and not just one. And the reason that it's helpful to have the genomics to understand what's going on is when you understand whether this was just a one-off event or whether there were more than that, it tells you something about the apparent risk. The fact that there were two separate introductions suggests that there is a little more risk than if there was, if there was just one. Yeah, and I think it also, you know, to my point, after hearing that, the concern that I had was maybe these events that David mentioned uh, were amplifiers, but that, as he very astutely mentioned, the fact that there are sequences that have been circulating, we're finding cases so quickly, that potentially there was a low level transmission that was ongoing for a while uh, in, in both Europe and the US. Uh, we don't know, I guess, when. Uh, would you guys agree with that assessment? I mean, from what we know so far from the, the initial sequencing of strains that's been done and, and sort of trying to piece it together, you know, I, I mean, I think there is a suggestion of at least two separate introductions. Um, and, and that this may have been here longer than we thought. I mean, when this first started or when it was first identified, I was actually at a meeting in Madrid with a, a Geosentinel meeting and one of our site directors from London said, oh, we've had a couple of cases and they're being very secretive about it. And then it exploded over the next week. Um, and and it, it, it probably had been going on for you know, much longer than just a start in early May. 
So one thing that we've talked about is how this has been sort of a typical presentation. Can you speak about, David, about what this pres clinical presentation of this would look like? And just to give a thought to our clinicians who are listening or even patients who may, you know, who may be interested in finding the symptoms, what does monkeypox usually look like and what are we seeing now? I mean, usually it starts out with a prodrome of fever, um, sort of muscle aches, body aches, maybe headache, um, and then a rash develops. And, it, and it, it, the rash is, is um, usually synchronous. That is, it all sort of the lesions are, are following the same timeline, which is different from chicken pox, where there may be some lesions that are just starting and others that are crusting over. Um, you know, I think the difference is that that a lot of people are seeing a rash more prominent in the sort of lower abdomen groin area. Um, and, and that, that um, uh, is a little bit different from having a widespread rash, but this is a rash that you can get on the, the palms and soles. And that, that, that's a fairly characteristic thing, but eventually the rash progresses from a you know, little papule to a pustule and, and, and really is uh, some of the pustules can be relatively large and look fairly different from chickenpox, although clearly chickenpox is, is one of the major diseases in the differential. Yeah, so for people who might be wondering what this rash looks like, it's the generally the kind of rash that you might see is similar to what people may see, but slightly different than chickenpox and herpes. Would that be fair to say that this would be uh, lesions that were fluid filled, the, the rash that they would see? Fluid filled and sort of almost like a milky looking fluid um, and, and, and potentially a little bit larger than you might see with, with chicken pox or, or herpes lesion. And is that what we're currently seeing as well in many of the patients? In some of the patients, yes, but some are, are having uh, sort of smaller lesions, some that have crusted over. I mean, because some are presenting late, they're, they're, they're being missed. The diagnosis is not being made because clinicians aren't thinking about it. I mean, honestly, if you look at you know, the, the, the first case in the U.S., the clinicians were agonizing over what this disease was, and they'd done lots of tests, and then suddenly they read about monkeypox elsewhere, and they said, ah, that's it. Um, so, so, you know, it is presenting in an atypical manner and, and some of the individuals who have had it. One of the things that I think you mentioned, and this is a question for both of you, is that there are already tools in our toolbox. We have a uh, testing, um, you know, the laboratory response network, the LRN, um, has multiple sites. It seems to be part of the reason why we're not getting as many people tested in the U.S. as, as you said, the clinician uh, recognition. But then we may also want additional tests developed. When you mentioned antivirals and vaccines, um, can you both talk a little bit about the vaccines and the antivirals available for, for this and how effective they are? Show it's all you know in terms of treatment. Um, uh, you know because this is a relatively mild disease. I think the most important thing is really supportive treatment to help prevent um, you know itching and things that might lead to a secondary bacterial wound infection. Um, and then of course isolation, so you can limit spread to other people. Um, you know I think that that the the disease you know so basically is, is is largely supportive management. However, there are uh, two different drugs. Um, that are available, you know, um, at least one of them, I think, is through an IND, an investigational new drug protocol. It's a drug called Tecoviramat, um, which is really, it's FDA approved for smallpox. Um, there's a few others. There's Sidofavir, which is a, a treatment for uh, CMV that we, we know from days of, in the past, where we've used this for treating uh, CMV retinitis. Um, and there's also vaccinia immune globulin, which probably would help cross protect against somebody with, with, the, with uh, the disease. Um, and there, in, in any case, you know, I think that a lot of these are, are, other than maybe some animal studies, there's not a lot of human data using these agents. Um, so, so you know, if, if we had a more severe case or somebody who was very immunocompromised, that, that, that would be the scenario where it would be worth considering both the vaccine immune globulin and, and potentially one of these drugs. Yeah. And John, do you want to speak about the vaccines that are currently available as well? Yeah, from uh, one of the fortunate things that about being able to respond to monkeypox is that our experience with smallpox has given us a lot of experience and a lot of tools. It, it, there, the smallpox vaccine, also called vaccinia, was 
used to eradicate smallpox around the world. And from circumstantial data that was gathered then, it's been recognized that that vaccine does protect against monkeypox in a significant number of cases. We still have that vaccine. We have derivatives of that vaccine that are known to be safer than the original smallpox vaccine, which did have a low level of side effects. And so the, the intervening years have been spent trying to make a vaccine that is just as good, but has fewer side effects. And so though there, are, as David mentioned, there are now two separate vaccines that can be used in this context. And that's really very encouraging. If you think about it compared to SARS-CoV-2 to COVID-19, at the beginning of the outbreak, there really were no tools. At the beginning of, or perhaps in the middle of this monkeypox spread, there are a lot of tools that can be brought to bear. I agree with David that some of them are not as well tested as we would like, but they are in advanced development. There's a tremendous amount known about them and they can be applied really quickly. And can, I, can I add that, that it's, it's really, I mean, the, the US, the Centers for Disease Control has been preparing for something like this. Although I think their concern is that there could be a smallpox outbreak. Even though smallpox has been eradicated, there's still a concern that somewhere someone might have it. And so therefore they have stockpiles of, of these medications and the vaccines uh, in, in sort of special places across the United States that can be mobilized very quickly. So they really have a, a large amount of vaccine doses available in case there were a large outbreak. I don't think so far um, there, there really has been minimal use. I mean, I, I think some for some exposed healthcare workers, but, but again, you know, if healthcare workers are using proper protective equipment, you know, they should have zero risk of becoming infected. Well, the interesting thing is, you know, um, I saw the Euro surveillance report last week about the experience of European countries that are tackling with more monkeypox cases than we are currently, and that the uptake of the vaccine may be an issue as well. I think it was, you know, what was it, less than 20% of the household contacts um, of the people who've had it actually accepted the vaccine, which seems to be a sort of issue that's bled over from potentially the vaccine hesitancy that we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so that seems to be a, a, a challenge. The other, you know, I, I want to circle back to the some of the things to be concerned about. I've heard that one of the concerns about continuing transmission is that, as you said, um, since prior outbreaks um, saw continued transmission by seeding into animal hosts, right? Um, that the, that the virus, if it transmits long enough, will find potential uh, reservoirs, potential other hosts, animal hosts in this country, and then it might be uh, harder to, to get rid of. Do you find that that's a valid uh, concern? I, I mean, I think we don't have a real good handle on what species of animals are hosts in the wild. Uh, there's clearly some evidence that certain kinds of species of rodents are. Um, and, and so you know, the, by analogy, you know, we have you know, rats of different kinds and, and other related animals in the US. So there's, you know, in the US and, and, and Western Europe and many, many high income countries. So the potential, at least theoretical for, for this to be introduced into animal, an animal reservoir and to persist there is, is you know, it's, it's, a, it's, I'd say a small risk. Um, but that would make it a lot more challenging and something that uh, to to manage, and and we'd have to be attuned to it and be thinking about it, you know, constantly instead of just in the context of this outbreak. Yeah, I agree with David that it's it is understood that there could be an animal reservoir. Prairie dogs, uh, American prairie dogs, were successfully infected in the two thousand and three outbreak. That was one of the animal reservoirs. It never got into the wild population. I prefer to think that's a really, really low probability. But if it happened, it would likely change how we think about monkeypox. Can I tell you, ask you guys the burning question that I think everybody has, right, in terms of your particular fields, what would you like seen from both the research aspects of this response and the public health aspects of this response? What should we be doing 
um, as a country, as a global public health community, that we, we could be doing better currently in the monkeypox response. Well, I have one comment. I mean, I have been, through my role as the surveillance lead for GeoSentinel, I've been communicating with sites in Europe, and we've, we've developed a protocol for supplemental data collection on all the monkeypox cases seen at our sites. I already have a non-research determination, have developed an electronic database, uh, sent that to all the sites over a week ago. And some of the sites are writing saying, you know, this is like the fourth different project, different organization that's asking us to collect data and they're overlapping. So there's a lack of coordination um, with among, you know, I say between the US and Europe, but even within Europe. I mean, they, they, they mentioned, you know, the Spanish Society of Dermatology and the Spanish Society of this infectious disease. I mean, there's all these different organizations that are trying to collect data concurrently. And there's no centralized coordination of those efforts. What would you like seeing done, both in response and in research, I guess, in response to this, John? Yeah, so I think one of the things that this is, one of the things that is obvious about this outbreak is that we have kind of been waiting for it to happen. Maybe we didn't want it to happen, <laughs> but there have been introductions time and time again for decades now. So the idea that this will happen again is not really just a, oh, it is unlikely to happen. It will continue to happen. And I think there has been a sense that all pox viruses are a solved problem. And this is a wake up call that it is not a solved problem. There are real risks to treating pox viruses as meh, not very important. So I think having an increased understanding that monkeypox could show up and in various different ways that other pox viruses like cowpox could do the same is really important. I think I'm super excited that we already have vaccines. We already have what could be first line therapies. I would be really excited if we also moved to develop second line therapies with the understanding that if these viruses continue to be introduced and reintroduced, it would be nice to have a large pharmacopoeia to protect against any serious disease. Yeah, and I would imagine you might want, David, from your perspective, more uh, data on the efficacy of the current medical treatments as well. Now is our time, and people don't usually get it that it's the catch-22 is that you can have promising drugs, but to prove their efficacy, you need to wait until an outbreak so you have people who are at risk so you can actually deploy it. Um, are there other things that you'd like to see in the research uh, response? Well, uh, yeah, I, I think it would be helpful to learn more about transmission <clears throat> to understand, you know, as I mentioned, asymptomatic transmission, does that happen? Um, um, does the virus get into certain body fluids like you know, semen or sperm, um, which we learned a lot about Zika, it could be transmitted sexually. Um, and we have no idea whether that's the case, <clears throat> excuse me, with monkeypox. Um, I think it also will be helpful to see with all the healthcare workers that are managing patients with monkeypox, if they're using effective protective equipment, will there be any breakthrough infections? Sure. That, that alone is just very simple, but really good knowledge, because I, I think that we're going to find the answer is no, and that if we're using the right precautions, um, we can easily prevent um, people from healthcare workers from being infected. And that, 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 that'll be very reassuring. Yeah, I'm going to go back to a point of irony on something that John mentioned. You know, we've known about this disease for a really long time, and, and it's been causing outbreaks in endemic diseases in endemic countries for a really long time. The question that our viewers would probably be asking is if we had an effective vaccine, we have all these treatments, and we knew that this was a threat, why didn't we act to try to make these more controllable outbreaks, or why didn't we use the oppor you know, opportunity to partner with our global partners in countries where the monkeypox is endemic to do the research. I guess that is a, another example of where we failed is in North-South collaborations to improve our knowledge of these pathogens and helping our global community as well. Um, so go ahead, David. Yeah, no, as you say, you know, I mean, you know, this is 
I would put this in the category of a neglected tropical disease. I mean, there's just not much money that's been put into it. And, and you know, it's been, if you look at data from the last decade in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in particular, there are many more cases, you know, year by year. So this has been expanding there. And that's probably because of the loss of immunity from smallpox vaccination as we have a larger and larger, younger portion of the population who have not received that vaccine. And then cases have also been steadily rising in Nigeria, which is one of the most densely populated countries in, in, in Africa. So, uh, you know, I think we need to be thinking now about trying to understand more about the disease epidemiology, disease transmission and treatment um, in, in these places, because those lessons learned can be applicable to the United States. Very good point. And I think uh, also expanding on what you said about the smallpox vaccine and the phenomenon of monkeypox cases. So what people should know is that we stopped vaccinating for smallpox when we eradicated the disease. By the way, the only, I think, so far the disease that we've eradicated, there might be others on the way, we're close. Um, and, and when we did that, we stopped vaccinating against smallpox. And the smallpox vaccine, I believe, has cross protections against uh, monkeypox. And the thought is one of the reasons why you're seeing an increased number of cases in areas where this is endemic is because, as David mentioned, a loss of immunity. So let me end um, by saying this. We're, we're, we'll do another update, hopefully, in, in, with an interval that passes. But what, should, what message do you want to impart to the general public that's listening to this today? Uh, I'll, I'll start when I, I, I think that you know, this this is going to be this outbreak is going to be controlled We're, it's going to um, it's it's not a large scale threat to the general public, um, but 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 everyone is at risk. Uh, I think that with proper precautions, we can reduce the risk of healthcare workers becoming infected to a very low level, if not zero. Um, it, it's an opportunity for us to test systems in terms of international coordination. Um, but also to try you know, some of the treatments, the vaccines that we have available um, and, and see how they work in the context of an outbreak. So it's an opportunity, but we, it, it's really an opportunity to grow so that we can be better prepared next time. Great, John, your thoughts? I, I think I agree. I, from, from the history that we have with monkeypox, there is good experience in the West, but also in endemic countries at when cases are found, figuring out how, how to control them so that there is not dramatic spread. I think a lot of that is gonna revolve around identification that it is monkeypox and reporting that it's monkeypox. I don't think it's gonna go away if everybody just sits and hopes it goes away. But if there is reporting, if there is seeking of help and there's recognition, we have good tools. And these are outbreaks that have been controlled before. Great, thank you both so much for your time today. I think this is gonna be really informative for a lot of people who are wondering about what monkeypox is and what it sort of entails for our near future. Um, uh, we'll have both Dr. Hamer and Dr. Connor join, join us and uh, with a short interval to give us an update in the future. But thank you all for your time as well in joining us.